Good morning. I would like to welcome everyone here this morning as people are finishing coming in and a warm welcome to any visitors that are here uh, for this service this morning. I pray that uh, your hearts would feel welcomed here uh, and that uh, God has placed you here for a reason this morning. Uh, and that's for everyone that's here, uh, that there's something special for this morning for each and every one of us in this service. So a uh, warm welcome to those who are on uh, online as well or on the phones as well. Uh, it's Marcus Wagler. I will be the worship leader for this morning. Uh, the call to worship that I picked uh, for this morning, this verse popped out to me a number of weeks ago already. Um, that I uh, wanted it to position ourselves from a perspective of a prayerful heart as we, as we go into the service this morning. Uh, and then to to prepare our hearts of of the day to day stuff that we go through as well. That uh, there can be a lot of stuff that's happening around us, and we see we see what's happening within the world. Uh, we're hypersensitive to what's happening within Israel and Gaza right now. But this this kind of turmoil and the whole earth groaning uh, in pain is happening in many places around the world. Uh, in a physical and spiritual manner everywhere. And that's not to take away from any situation that's happening. So uh, the call to worship for this morning is Psalm 138, uh, verse 1 and 2. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give you thanks. To your name, your steadfast, your love, and your love and faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. Let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for the opportunity to gather here this morning. I thank you for the, the blessing of the extra hour uh, in, our, in our lives today. That, uh, that we could just prepare our hearts to come in here uh, and just be uh, open to what the Holy Spirit has for for us in this service. I pray that each and every person that is here, that their hearts would be touched in a special way this morning, and that your name would be honored and glorified, and that we would bring uh, a pleasing sacrifice to you within this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll call Donna and Nick up for the worship songs. Good morning. Please stand if you're able to and turn in your hymnals to number 383. Number 383. <laughs>
number 417. 417. Number 480.
915. Number 915. seated. I'll be reading the scripture verse for today from Luke 16, verse 19 to 31. I'll give you some time if you want to look it up to follow along. I'll be reading from the uh, ESV version. Luke 16, 19 to 31. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linens and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, 
Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried. The poor man d- died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in, in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send, send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that, they, that, they, that he may warn them, lest they also can come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father, Father. But if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if somebody should rise from the dead. So I called Brent up for the message of what home do you choose. I'm going to just pray with Brent before we get started as well. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for the opportunity to gather as believers here this morning. I thank you for the anointing that you've placed on Brent's heart um, as leadership within this church. And I just thank you for uh, the stepping in faith to preach from this this part of uh, Luke that is uh, an intriguing part of Luke. So I pray that you would use Brent as a, a vessel to bring this message this morning and prepare our hearts uh, to have from this what you, you have called us to take from this message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Pharisees loved money, Luke says. It's not unusual, is it? We can be quick to distance ourselves from these men, but it is a human problem. The Pharisees are not especially rich or powerful. Most have ordinary jobs. They believe God wants a close relationship with his people. They cherish his word. They long for a society that would honor the Lord. They're eagerly waiting for the coming of the Messiah and the resurrection to eternal life. Some Pharisees are with Jesus in Luke 16. As he speaks of using worldly wealth to invest in the eternal purposes of God. In verse 13, before the passage that Marcus read for us, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Well, how easily we let money dominate us spiritually, whether we have lots or very little. Mark Vincent, I think, describes this well. He says, money has a godlike power. I think about it a lot how and when I might get more of it, what I will do with it once I get it, how much of it I want to share, how much I want to keep for myself, what I would do with it if I suddenly came into a large amount. Well, what would you do if you won the lottery? He adds, money consumes my waking moments and shows up in my dreams. Is this unusual? No. No. 
Money can be overpowering, can't it? Now, commenting on what Jesus teaches, Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote, Our hearts have room for only one all-embracing devotion, and we can cleave to only one Lord. Jesus lays out our choice. How will we respond? Luke says, The Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. So they claim to live for God, but their love for money blinds them. And so they they can't grasp the values of his kingdom. Their hearts are out of sync with him. And so Jesus tells this vivid, unsettling story. And he reveals critical realities about life after death, not to satisfy our curiosity, but to lay bare our spiritual choice and call us to repent of our sins. There's a rich man. Jesus doesn't give him a name, but he tells us how he was dressed. In his day, wealthy people wore clothes made from wool, shrunk, and thickened in a basin with special clay. It was time-consuming and expensive, but it resulted in a brilliantly white cloth. But still, even that luxury was considered common, even modest, compared to fabric dyed in Tyrian purple from the shell of a certain um, shellfish in the region. To wear white under a purple robe? Well, that took serious money. What else does Jesus say about him? He says, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. So that term for lived in luxury can also be translated as feasted sumptuously. Now, normally it speaks of a great banquet with a calf killed to feed as many as 100 guests. That's how the man eats every day. In an economy where even well-off families could only afford to kill a calf on special occasions, right? They wouldn't have had meat every day, like much of the world today. He feasted sumptuously. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores. So notice, Lazarus has a name, while the rich man goes nameless. That's not usually how it works in this world. Jesus reverses the normal pattern. What else do we learn about Lazarus? Well, he was covered with sores and longing to eat with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. Well, today we might think, well, that's nice. At least the dogs gave him some comfort. But that's not how it would have been seen in the first century. Those originally listening to Jesus would not have imagined a pet or a companion, but stray dogs roaming the outskirts of town, rummaging for scraps to eat. With dogs licking his sores, Lazarus is ritually unclean, an outcast on the street outside this rich man's estate. Jesus says he was laid there, which suggests that he was lame and not able to earn a living. So we see this tremendous privilege and poverty side by side. What would that do to you? What would you do? What do you do? The nameless rich man does nothing. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. So he's honored in death, he's buried. It would have been an unspeakable shame to be refused burial, to be left exposed to the elements and scavengers. Everyone would assume that such a person was cursed by God. The rich man is buried. Jesus doesn't say that Lazarus was given that dignity. The contrast between these two men could not be greater, but in death, their circumstances are reversed. Angels carry 
Lazarus to Abraham. Now, there's another time Jesus describes a future feast in the kingdom of God when with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the prophets being joined with people from the east, the west, the north, and the south who take their place at the table. If Lazarus is with Abraham, his famine is over. He's arrived at that banquet with the Lord and his people. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus by his side, with Lazarus by his side. So Hades is Greek for Sheol, which in most of the Old Testament speaks of the grave or a realm of the dead where there's neither joy nor punishment. So there, there's kind of within much of the Old Testament, there's um, not a lot of clarity about what happens to someone after they die. In, but, but there come to be, in some of the later prophets, some glimpses of the future. So in Daniel 12, for example, the Lord promises a future beyond the grave, beyond Sheol. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth, the Lord says, will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. And of course, it's Jesus, Messiah Jesus, who unlocks the key. He gives us new clarity and confidence about this resurrection. And of course, it's not just through his teaching, but also, even most importantly, in his own defeat of death, dying for our sins on the cross and being raised victorious from the grave. Apostle Paul calls him the first fruits from the dead, <laughs> right? Like the first First fruits of the crop, of a new crop, of a harvest. Jesus is the first raised from the dead as he was. Not just, not for his own sake, but that we might join him. That those who are united with him by faith would also share in his resurrection. So that's the bigger picture. The Pharisees in Luke 16 would never imagine what was to come. So Jesus doesn't unpack the, the full realities of the new heaven and new earth or of hell in this story, but he does reveal essential truth about eternity. The New Testament never speaks of Hades in relation to a person Jesus has saved. So for this, for this rich man, it's clearly a place of punishment, of torment. So is he already in hell? Or is he in a waiting place for those who will be condemned at the final judgment? There, there's lots of debate about this. Based on other passages, you know, we wouldn't expect any communication between heaven and hell. But this is a parable. We, we don't, so there are things we don't know, but the message of Jesus is clear. The rich man, he called to him, Father Abraham. Have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. So clearly, as he describes it, that's well, that's well beyond how the Old Testament would describe Hades. It, it's, he's definitely in a place of punishment. But he sees himself as a child of Abraham. Is he really? He, no doubt, had the right family tree. Yet, when John the Baptist called people to get right with God, he said, would be in Luke chapter 3, verse 8, he said, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. To be a son or daughter of Abraham is to stand before God with genuine faith. 
In John 8, Jesus says, if you were Abraham's children, then you would do what Abraham did. Right? Abraham's faith it wasn't passive, but active. The second chapter of the book of James makes that point really strongly. Abraham was especially known for his hospitality to strangers. Day after day, this rich man ignored a suffering man outside his gate. Is he a child of Abraham? He's in Hades. Does he ask to get out? Does he beg Abraham to let him join Lazarus at his side? No. He just wants a little relief. He's stuck. He still thinks, though, that he can call the shots. He still thinks people like Lazarus exist to serve his needs. He's, he's in torment. But he doesn't ask to be in the presence of God. For his whole life, he has cultivated his identity as a rich man. That's what mattered. Now he's been stripped of everything. He's in agony, and yet he's not humbled. What's going on here? He had built his whole life on wealth and status. And of course, wealth, it's not the money alone. It also buys you a certain place in the world. <laughs> when he died, his idols were taken away. What does he have left? Nothing. Everything that once defined him is gone. How does Abraham answer? He says, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. He had staked his life on those good things. He claimed to be a child of Abraham, but in truth he defined who he is and all that shaped his life apart from God. He chose hell. Jesus doesn't mention any other sins of this rich man. This is more than enough to establish his destiny. Our choice has set the course for our, of our lives, not only for the next few years, but for eternity. C.S. Lewis wrote, there are only two kinds of people. Those who say, thy will be done to God, or those to whom God, in the end, says, thy will be done. All that are in hell, choose it. Abraham tells the rich man, and besides all this, between us and you, there is a great chasm. A great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. So there was a time he could have done a kind deed like this. The very thing he was asking that Lazarus would do for him, he could have done that for Lazarus. He was free to walk in and out of his gate as often as he liked. He could have taken oil for the poor man's wounds. He might have carried bread meat, olives, water, and milk for him. But his time for choosing is past. After death, the chasm, the uncrossable gulf, it's fixed. There'll be no traveling back and forth. The separation is permanent, irreversible. Well, hearing this, the self-centered man shows the first glimmer of care for others. Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. So the rich man does have a circle of concern beyond himself, but it's drawn very narrowly. It's only around his own family. 
Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. In other words, if anyone wants to know what God desires, the scripture's clear. Right? And of course, at this point, Jesus is speaking about the Old Testament scriptures. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus, again, another time, said all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So the rich man cannot plead ignorance for himself or his family. God has given us all the revelation we need in his word. There, there's no excuse. Still, the man begs, no, Father Abraham. But if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Now, Jesus really did raise a man named Lazarus from the dead. The religious leaders didn't dispute the miracle. And yet, some at least plotted to have Jesus crucified. They refused to believe he was the Messiah. God, in the person of Jesus, came to them in the disguise of a poor man. But they closed their hearts. There is good news, though. Jesus came to save people who are bound for hell. Feeding the hungry will not earn any of us a place in the kingdom of God. But can we say we belong to Jesus if we turn our backs on the hungry? This story is a challenge to examine our hearts. Ambrose, a church leader in the fourth century, wrote, There is your brother, naked and crying, and you stand confused over the choice of an attractive floor covering. This is the fourth century. There's nothing wrong with wanting your home decor to match. Don't feel false guilt around this, please. But it's a question of priorities. What have you built your life on? What do you truly value? Who is your Lord and Master? Where are you storing your treasure? Luke 16 is not the last that Jesus speaks of eternal life. When he was crucified, one of the criminals beside him on Golgotha cried out, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And how did the Lord answer? Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. That man didn't have the opportunity to live out his repentance. But clearly Jesus knew his heart. And he knew that it was an authentic cry of faith. He doesn't leave us to flounder, wondering how we can possibly be made worthy of eternal life. Let's turn to John chapter 14. There are other passages we, where we could go to as well, but this is especially clear here. So, in John 14, Jesus assures his disciples, and this is like right at, this is the night of his arrest, just after he has told Peter that he would deny him three times, right? So, so Peter's faced with this reality of his terrible failure before the Lord. And he kind of protests. He doesn't want to accept that. Then right after Jesus says that, he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Really? You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Do you see his incredible love? He does not want anyone to be tormented in Hades or to perish in hell. 
far from it. No, Jesus has prepared an eternal home for us where bodies are made new, hearts healed, a place with no sadness or pain. He wants you there. Not as a guest, but at home, in his presence, surrounded by his beauty and glory. That's what Jesus accomplished for us when he died on the cross for our sins and when he conquered death. Still, when he speaks of his father's house, his followers are confused. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? You can always count on Thomas to ask an honest question. People have all kinds of theories about getting to heaven. Many hope to balance out their sins with acts of generosity or kindness. Others seek to gain eternal life by performing certain religious acts or doing their best to live an upright life. All these strategies assume that we can win God's favor with our own effort, our human effort. But how could we ever give enough or pray enough or be good enough? Theories like that only leave us guessing. And they misunderstand the whole nature of eternal life. On the night, again, that night, of his arrest, before he was crucified, Jesus prayed for us. In John 17, talking with his heavenly Father, he says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life is bound up in relationship. You know, sometimes people think of heaven a bit as like a wish dream kind of like Bing Crosby singing, I'll be home for Christmas if only in my dreams, something like that. But Jesus offers us a real home, not a ticket to an imaginary paradise, but genuine life with God. Eternal life is more about a person than a place. Heaven is real, but at the center is a relationship. And so when Jesus responds to Thomas's question, he doesn't give answers, he gives himself. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Our sin would forever exclude us from the presence of God. Apart from Jesus, we are utterly hopeless, spiritually dead, deserving the wrath of God. But God made a way for us to be saved. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He bore the penalty for our sins. Jesus, through his sacrifice on the cross, has become our door into the presence of our Heavenly Father. He bridges that huge chasm between us in our sin and a holy God. He is the way. There is no other. He's also the truth. Jesus embodies authentic reality. There's no falsehood in him. With grace and power, God reveals himself through Jesus, his Son. And so he enables us to find our own true identity. There are all kinds of things in this world we can use to try to build our identity, to try to prove our worth. We only find our true identity in a relationship with Jesus by trusting in him, by being in a relationship with him, by believing him about what he says about us. Jesus is the life. We chase after life, after happiness in so many different ways, don't we? Jesus is the only source, real source of abundant life, satisfying and free. Have you discovered this yourself? There's no greater joy than to know Jesus. That is the essence of eternal life. In John 14, verse 7, He says, he adds, If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. It's incredible, isn't it? Jesus not only carries the keys to his Father's house, he also shows us his face. 
everything rests on him. He is our anchor. Do you trust him? Will you let him lead you home? He has prepared a place for you. The word of God assures us that he does not want anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. There's no shortage of room in the kingdom of God. Jesus shows us so clearly on the cross that he would rather go to hell for us than to go to heaven without us. And still, as deeply as he loves us, as patient as he is, he will not force us or anyone into his kingdom. He begs us to come home. But in the end, he cannot make that decision for us. The choice is yours and mine. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the way that you show us your heart through your word. We thank you, Lord, that you are so far beyond the idols of this world. that in the light of your truth and glory, they're shown to be what they are. And yet you know how easily we fall into their grip. Whether it's money or the desire for others to think well of us, whether, yeah, or any of the other idols that are in this world. Lord, we ask that by your grace, that your Holy Spirit would reveal to each of us greater clarity, a greater vision of who you are, that your goodness and glory would dominate our minds and imaginations, that you would give us a hunger and thirst for you, your kingdom, your righteousness, that far exceeds any other passion. We ask, Lord, that you would enable us to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that you would enable us to love our neighbor as ourself that you would, would give us hearts that are aligned with yours so that our decisions, our actions flow from that. Lord, you know each one of us here inside and out. You know where we stand in relation to you. So Lord, if there is anyone who... is not in a right relationship with you. And you're speaking to this morning. We ask by your grace that you would lead each one, including those of us who have surrendered to you in the past. We ask, Lord, that you would again lead us spiritually to the cross, that we would be able to be honest before you, about our sin, that we would be able to receive the fullness of your grace released through your blood shed on the cross. That each of us would be able to partake of your resurrection life through our relationship with you. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would draw each of us close to you that this would not just be um, kind of a theology in our head, but that, but that we would experience the truth of, of that relationship, the truth of who you are. That we'd be able to walk.
closely with you, abiding in you, bearing good fruit that brings honor and glory to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.